California at Berkeley, um, majoring in molecular cell biology. He has a master's of public health also from University of California at Berkeley. He completed his medical education at Turo, Turo. Turo University in California, College of Osteopathic Medicine, and he is currently a third year psychiatry resident at East Tennessee State University. Please welcome Dr. Hu. Hi everyone, good morning, thank you for coming. Um, so, I know the title was uh, Leadership Within Psychiatry, but I also wanted to talk about um, the state of psychiatry and more so relating with potential leadership opportunities that we see going forward in the field. Um, I want to make some brief acknowledgments and discuss my associate affiliations and a brief disclosure. I want to give a big thanks to Dr. George Brown, who has uh, continued to be very supportive in my career. And I really admire his work, especially in, in the field of uh, transgender issues. I, I am personally involved with the American Psychiatric Association as one of their um, national committee members, uh, particularly in the area of uh, medical education and lifelong learning, which I just completed. And also, I serve on the uh, committee within the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Um, I also was involved with um, uh, the East Tennessee Psychiatric ch Chapter, which uh, oh, Dr. Hendrick, we had established early on and um, is currently in development, and I have no financial disclosures. So the question why everyone's coming is, what makes leaders in psychiatry? And for me, I was trying to figure out in terms of, is it characteristics? Is it uh, personalities? What exactly is important, especially going forward in the field? And um, the way I thought about it, more importantly, was for uh, individuals to think that psychiatry is kind of this fluid and dynamic process, such as medicine, but I think going forward, it's going to change a lot. And what I'd like to do is kind of discuss that in particular and how we can adapt and modify ourselves in terms of approaching the field. And the way I see it is we need knowledge about the past and the present right now in order to plan for the future. So this is going to be a brief outline on what I'm going to be talking about, primarily looking at um, the evolution of the field, which I just talked about, from more of this philosophical, psychoanalytical perspective towards more of a molecular and biological model, which we are tend to be going towards today. Uh, in addition, I'm going to be talking about the challenges that face the field, uh, give you some statistics, and talk about some resource issues and discuss some perspectives from larger institutions that are really defining uh, mental health, including the National Institutes of Mental Health, which is a branch of the NIH, as well as the World Psychiatric Association, which has really looked into what the perspective changes are going to come in our field. Also, I'll, I'll briefly touch upon future opportunities that we should be aware of in terms of changes in the way we practice, utilizing technology, as well as looking at um, biomarkers as potential ways to improve the care that we deliver for our patients. And finally, I'll talk about briefly um, future leadership skills and opportunities that will arise as, this, as we go towards the future. So um, I want to preface by saying that psychiatry has actually come a long way in terms of the way we um, think about the human condition in the mind. And um, there's this concept that some people say that we are essentially changing this, this determinate deterministic perspective that uh, is set forth by what some philosophers think is the way human beings are. So um, Carl, Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud, as you know, have been leaders in the field early on. They have um, basically conceptualized this concept of the conscious and unconscious through psychoanalysis. And I perceive them more as uh, philosophers in the field trying to find some rationality within the way we approach uh, patients with uh, mental illness. And we're kind of slowly mo moving towards a model where we're integrating more of this biological and neurological um, information that we are establishing as we, as we learn more about science and the way the mind works and integrating that with uh, psychology. And we see that as, uh, as the way we approached it in the past with using both medication and psychotherapy. But now we're kind of moving towards a, a different avenue in terms of looking at um, a medicine model, which is basically 
um, utilizing best practices, evidence-based practice, and medicine. And there's a decrease in inpatient institutionalizations, as we've seen. And this is not just nationally, but globally. And also a focus on medication management and whether or not um, this approach is um, the best way, I think it's, it's a little bit of a controversy even within our field. So um, this is just a basic representation um, by Freud. I, I don't know if many of you have seen this, basically talking about the conscious and unconscious. But it really shows that Freud was trying to utilize um, kind of a means to, to um, understand the way people think and behave in a, in a more systematic manner that is, um, I guess, trying to be more objective given his uh, limited knowledge of kind of the neurobiology at that time. So it was really kind of a, a novel and really creative way to think. And I think it's kind of held true even today. And there's different types of uh, research that really reinforce the way he, he thinks about the human mind in terms of both unconscious and conscious scenarios. Um, so we've kind of are in this era now where there's a, a large focus on um, the biological models. And this is um, what we, we talk about when we uh, discuss the ways our medications work with the monoamine model, basically utilizing different types of neurotransmitters, altering, altering receptors, and ultimately creating change in behaviors for our patients. Um, the question for us is how much of this is uh, effective in terms of treating and hopefully getting remission for our patients, as well as is this the correct approach in terms of generating change for our patients? Because that's the end goal, is to help improve the lives of um, people with mental illness. So what does this all mean for psychiatry? I think the future of psychiatry is going to be utilizing a lot more objective as we kind of understand the mind a little bit. And I'll go into detail a little bit more. But also, I think as a future leader in the field, we really need to be um, kind of smart in the way we adapt to the new information that we're going to be getting, both from, and I'll talk about it a little later, um, computer models and different types of research that will be coming out about how uh, different new forms of medication will be working. And there's a different perspective in terms of the way we approach uh, um, the thinking of the mind for our patients. There's a concept of a valence-based approach from the RDOC within the NIMH, which I'll talk about briefly, that really conceptualizes both a biological and psychoanalytical model in terms of looking at people make decisions and how that ultimately leads to behavioral changes. And finally, um, I see that there's going to be more of an integration between um, psychoanalysis, psychopharmacology, and all this will ultimately be combined together utilizing computers to be able to kind of parse out different types of patterns and behaviors of our patients. And that's going to be an emerging technology I think is going to be huge in terms of, uh, in terms of understanding our patients, not just at that snapshot level, which we typically see when they come to our clinics. And also, in addition, I, I think there's other aspects that are going to be crucial for a psychiatrist going forward. And that involves both understanding the mathematical as well as the the physics behind the way things work, as well as, I think, a more indirect way of thinking that something is not entirely um, rational, but more so in terms of the more abstract, such as art, philosophy, literature, things that are a little bit more um, concrete and I think really is reflective of kind of the human mind. And also talk about externalities, which are going to be important because, as you know, medicine is changing from a systemic uh, perspective as well as um, utilizing different types of financial models to uh, deliver care. So they really need to kind of find ways to adapt and change uh, in that landscape. And finally, there's discussions about if psychiatry really needs to kind of be more integrated in this social and political um, avenue, because um, there is a little bit of a separation, but those are big factors within our society that really impact our patients at the end of the day. So um, I'm going to move towards uh, talking about the challenges that we have in the field, particularly talking about some statistics, and give you some perspectives within an NIMH. So this is kind of a funny picture here. So I think this is a really interesting um, data that we got here from the CDC, which looks at uh, suicide rates, which is something that we're really concerned about 
when we have patients that come in. This is kind of the big, uh, big thing that, a big marker, I think, in terms of how well we are potentially doing kind of on a population level. And you see that there's a, still a steady increase um, in the past two decades. So that's a sign that maybe the way we're approaching things might need to change in order to kind of help reduce that, that role. Um, some say that if we use antidepressants as a means to kind of mitigate that, that will help reduce that. But if we see the, the data shows from CDC is that we're actually increasing our use of antidepressants, at least I think this is particularly for the US, but I think globally we're beginning to use more antidepressants. <laughs> However, you still see that as we increase our use, suicide hasn't gone down. But it's not to say that it's not effective. We do see some slight decrease, particularly among women. And this is uh, 2015 to 2016 in particular, where we do uh, reach a point, I think, in 2014, where it tends to go downward. So there is an effect with regards to medications. But how much are we trending downwards towards full remission is a different story. So the NIMH, just briefly a background, is, is an organization under the umbrella of NIH. And it was really established uh, in 1946. Um, I don't want to go too much in the nuances in the backgrounds, but I think it's important because they're a big organization doing a lot of important mental health research in terms of where we might be going forward. So some of the key objectives within IMH, and I'm going to go over this fairly briefly because there's other aspects that I want to discuss, but they're looking currently at this point at the mechanisms of how people behave. And it's very complex, as you know. Um, they're looking more of the biological uh, neuro anatomical models in terms of uh, neural circuitry, oops, neural circuitry uh, cellular levels, and different forms of, of new methods in terms of how we understand the human mind. And I think there was a previous discussion about connectomes, which is another way of understanding kind of the neuro neuronal connections of the mind. And um, there's multiple initiatives worldwide that are utilizing and, and slicing parts of the brain and use, utilizing aspects of uh, computer technology, such as machine learning, in order to properly map out regions of the brain, in particular those with mental illness. And I think that's going to be a boon in terms of our understanding of um, mental health. Um, another aspect of the MIH is looking at kind of the trajectory of the individual. So this talks about early intervention in terms of looking at how people um, perceive mental illness. So part of the problem is um, childhood, uh, childhood uh, analysis, as we see from ACES study, there's a lot of influence with regards to uh, trauma and impacts of that in the development going forward. So I think this is a really smart way of seeing how much uh, early sensitive periods in particular will impact the way people respond in the future as they age. And they talk more so about utilizing different markers and behavioral indicators as a way to understand that. Um, so another objective for the NIMH is focusing more on prevention. A lot of what we do is try to intervene early on. And what the NIMH is saying is that current drugs are not effective in preventing mental illness solely by itself. And we really need to find new ways. And I think um, drugs like ketamine, which we're actually doing here at ETSU, is actually going to be fairly significant in terms of the way we approach um, our patients in terms of immediate care. Um, also, they t there's a discussion about measuring um, how effective our current treatments are going forward. Um, the NIMH considers that the public health is a large part of um, the way mental health is treated. They look at new financing models as, as, as a new avenue to improve the quality of care. And in particular, uh, care integration is going to be a big part of the way we practice. So um, pub, like primary care physicians, pediat pediatricians, I think they're going to be working closely more with uh, psychiatrists going forward, as well as looking at technological advances, which I'll talk about more, where we kind of get real-time data instead of a, just a snapshot of our patients. Um, RDOC is, a, is an umbrella underneath um, uh, NIMH, 
which is really trying to conceptually change the way we look at um, the diagnosis of our patients. Um, it utilizes what I talked about earlier in terms of the psychological and biological systems uh, approach towards understanding and predicting possibly the way people think and act. So briefly, in terms of what RDoC is, there is a concept of positive valence systems, which is basically approaching um, the individual with regards to how motivated they are, how responsive they are to reward, and um, basically how they learn and, and the habits that they develop throughout time. In contrast to that, uh, negative valence systems are the exact opposite, where people develop depression and anxiety, and really it looks upon how fear and threat can impact the, the individual's behavior. In terms of the way um, the social component for the individual, there's a, there's a look with regards to how people are, uh, develop attachment issues, which we tend to look at even today as well as um, understanding the way we communicate socially. And this um, perception of the self versus, versus others is a lot of what they talk about within psych psychology in particular to help um, give us a clear picture of whether or not that fits within the social norms of the society we live in. Uh, I put in this cartoon, I think it would be um, uh, kind of funny with regards to what I talked about. It says, uh, Calvin, I don't know if you all read Calvin and Hobbes, um, he says, this, this piece of pie is awfully darn small. And Calvin's mother says, life could be worse, Calvin. Life, and then Calvin says, life could be a lot better, too. But worse is more likely. <laughs> so this, you know, you can think of this as Calvin um, more in conflict with his negative valence and accepting uh, the, the system of social process that he's in with regards to his mother. So um, they also talk about the cognition process in terms of how memory and, um, and self-control come into play, and also in terms of how we perceive uh, sensory data. So this is really kind of a more binary approach in terms of looking at how people think. Um, in addition, sleep is, is a big factor with regards to how people behave, and I think that um, having enough sleep and circadian uh, rhythms are, are one aspect that they also look at within RDoc. So this is just a brief snapshot in terms of um, some of the research that join within the NIMH. And if you look at kind of the various things I kind of pulled out, um, a lot of technologies is really going to be a part of it. Um, computational models, artificial intelligence, really kind of cutting, cutting edge stuff that we normally don't think about when we practice medicine. So. Um, I think things are going to be changing a lot, and I think in, in general with the computational changes that is going to be developed both within some of these uh, technology companies out west, that they can have a huge influence in the way people behave. So um, I also wanted to look more so on a, a global perspective. I think sometimes we get really kind of preoccupied with uh, this the environment that we're in, but a lot of the patients that we might see come from around the world here in the U.S. So given the global perspective, there's an organization called the World Psychiatric Association that really defines how um, psychiatry is practiced uh, throughout the world. Um, so the way internationally we approach mental illness is different with regards to how we categorize um, symptoms and care. I think the World Health Organization uses ICD-10, the U.S. uses uh, DSM by the APA, and um, those differences, despite that fact, there are similarities with regards to severe mental illness, which across the board um, between different nations, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in particular are still fairly similar in nature, but it's just how we define depression, anxiety, PTSD, these ancillary, mild, more, what they consider milder mental illness, is that more so of a social construct that varies across different countries, I and mean, that's a discussion all within itself. So one way to see how well uh, mental health is performing 
globally is to look at the disability adjusted life years. Um, the way they perceive it is, is the summation of years of disability and life lost. So if you look at the data in terms of the global DALI, is what they call it, neuropsychiatric disorders actually rank number three around the world. So it's pretty significant. However, if you look at um, the global YLD, which is the years lived with disability, it really does pop into number one, which basically means that from an international standpoint, neuropsychiatric conditions are really disabling and preventing people from being able to function within the society globally. So I think it's a really important thing to think about with regards to medicine because if we can treat the neuropsychiatric disorders, it may be able to downstream help in terms of some of the other diseases that people have. And this is more data, but this is more related with the U.S., also reflecting the neuropsychiatric disorders here in, the, in terms of uh, also being number one here in the U.S. So, so according to the numbers in, ter in terms of statistics, the World Health Organization says that uh, depression is still a significant burden of about 400 million, and there's a significant amount of people with dementia globally as well as um, schizophrenia, which, you know, despite international level being a small percentage, is still 21 million. And suicide, like what I discussed earlier, is still the second leading cause of death uh, among young people in particular. So this really shows that there's a lot that we need to do in terms of improving the way we approach mental health. I think in part, uh, the World Health Organization really recognizes that there's various factors that uh, determine uh, how people develop mental illness. And poverty is one aspect. Cultural and social phenomena are also attributable, as well as the political and environmental issues that we do all know about, um, and as well as the individual att attributes that we tend to um, associate with mental illness. Uh, in particular, they wanted to address uh, vulnerable populations such as LGBT and minorities, in particular, and elderly and children. And this quote by Freud, I think, is, is reflective of what I just talked about earlier. He said, devout believers are safeguarded in a high degree against the risks of certain neurotic illnesses. Their acceptance of the universal neurosis spares them from the task of constructing a personal one. And he also says, much will be gained if we succeed in transcending your hysterical misery into common happiness. With a mental life that has been restored to health, you should be better armed against that happiness. So there's kind of a duality between the individual um, uh, concept of mental health versus the societal aspect and whether or not that is imposing upon the free will of the individual. And that's, that's according to Sigmund Freud. Um, the WPA really lays out several priorities they think is going to be important going forward in our field. I'm not going to go too much in the nuances between um, a lot of these. I think um, I'll briefly touch upon it, but I think the last two in particular are going to be important in the way uh, we, we practice in psychiatry. So briefly, there, the WPA sees that um, the societal situation will be changing with older populations, more urbanization, and more connection digitally. But they also see that it's going to be important for leaders in the field to have this uh, understanding of different cultures and having cultural competency in order to reduce stigma in our field, which is still a problem. Uh, part of that requires better diagnostic approaches to, medicine, to psychiatry. I know that I talked about RDOC previously, but World Psychiatric Association tends to see that as either integrating or replacing DSM, and that's still kind of a more controversial aspect that um, I think will be changing, given as we understand RDOC a little bit more going forward. Um, they also see that uh, the way we approach medicine will require more integration with computers for measurement as well as screenings early on. And as a psychiatrist, we really kind of need to adapt to these new technologies and integrate them in terms of the way we provide care. So the delivery of healthcare is going to change as well. I think now we tend to utilize 
more of this episodic care. People who come in with crisis, or people who come in with very um, uh, non-destroyed appointments. We t typically also, I mean, if you're in the field, you know that there's a lot of no-shows, and sometimes patients aren't compliant with their medications. But in the future, they're saying that there will be more of a, I guess, less of this information gap because we're able to kind of obtain consistent data from our patients, both on a digital as well as kind of um, a documentation level. So for a psychiatrist, that means we really need to work closely with different organizations. I think that in part, you know, we're really uh, siloed in the way we practice. And as we approach more what they consider, this is a more of a business term, horizontal integration, that means we're going to be working with different types of providers. And adapting to that role is going to be, I think, something we need to work on and, and see where we can uh, make more of a positive impact for our patients. Um, I talked earlier about this concept of, of how institutions are, are being deconstructed around the world, particularly in the U.S. initially, but now globally. And um, that really requires us to be able to build alliances with um, um, people across the mental health profession in order to, to um, provide better care for our patients. We really need to find um, good integration with pharmacists, social workers, psychologists, to really combine and provide our patients with the services they need because at the end of the day, they don't have that really structured environment within the inpatient unit that they would get because we're moving away from that. And the financial component is also going to be reflective of that going forward. So the WPA sees the role of psychiatrists more along the lines of um, uh, understanding what role will we be playing in the future. Will we be more in terms of engaging in this uh, social control, which causes a lot of conflict with our patient, or more of this therapeutic uh, inspirational level, where we really set the model for our patients and help them attain a level where they can function a little bit better. And they're talking about um, the idea of reducing risk within the field, especially um, capturing those who are severely mentally ill early on. But I think it's more important also to see that psychiatry might play a larger role in terms of advocating for our patients and providing uh, more of a political integration because a lot of the legislation does impact our patients. So this requires working closely with communities too. It's not just about the individual patient, but it's also about who they tend to interact with. And um, that means working closely with families, um, setting, setting more opportunities to engage in the community are going to be crucial, but also from a technological perspective, there is that social media component that tends to affect our patients, and how much should we be playing a role in that avenue is something up in the air at this point. Um, they talk more about uh, psychiatry and the law with regards to um, how do we provide high quality care and giving patients autonomy. And I think that's a really tricky area that I think we need to really define going forward because as a, as a psychiatrist, you tend to assume the risk of the patients, but we don't understand to what extent um, mental illness is uh, affecting our patients to what level. So capturing those with severe mental illness is gonna be a big challenge, I think, going forward. But I think it's something where we really need to engage early on because if we don't, someone else will define that for us. Um, so this is one thing I really wanted to hone in on, and this is the concept of digital psychiatry. I think this is really going to be uh, profoundly more integrated in the way we practice. Um, one of the things they're doing now is, is building uh, a, pheno, a digital phenotype. I don't know if you all have heard, is basically when you use your phone, you're, you're tapping on the phone, and it registers how much you um, are interacting with the phone. And the way you type your responses, they capture all that data. And that's not just within um, you know, their phones. This is all the, also the way you interact online. And a lot of organizations are really capturing a lot of data, analyzing how people think and behave based on this data. So that data in itself is, is really privatized at this point. But it can be a, a central resource in terms of how we think about how patients are going to be 
possibly um, um, having episodes of like mania or psychosis, they're, they're really looking into how much of that is going to be um, utilizing digital phenotyping as a means to say, look, this patient potentially has a risk. They might need to come in and maybe we need to alert the patient or maybe we need to understand that. But there is also concerns about privacy issues. Um, this is different ways in terms of ways we capture the data. Um, I, I don't, we did a conversion from here from PowerPoint from Keynote because it didn't really work. So it was, it's not showing up. But basically, there's multiple areas in terms of where we're looking at in terms of getting real-time data for our patients and whether or not we're able to say, yes, as a clinician, we can access this data and be able to help treat you. I think that's going to be something where we need to have more of a formal um, discussion going forward. So I talked briefly about different means of preventing um, mental illness and capturing that before it occurs. But um, I think psychiatrists need to understand what types of technologies are out there. Because as it becomes more integrated, we really need to kind of be engaged with our patients and build that trust that's going to be necessary. Because a lot of people tend not to trust uh, organizations, but they, they do trust their providers sometimes in in uh, having that, what I consider possible medical data in, in their behaviors. So, uh, underneath all that, um, there are organizations that do a lot of data science and analysis uh, regarding the data. And as we capture more and more data, we are able to kind of more accurately predict how patients and, and people will, re will respond. And I think that's going to be crucial in terms of understanding um, and preventing those that have increased risk of mental illness. So they say that um, technology will be more of an augmentation at this time, but I think going forward it might be um, a very objective tool that we can utilize with our patients. So I'm a resident, obviously, and I think what they talk about in terms of training future psychiatrists is, um, is highly relevant. I think they really push for uh, this concept of integration, particularly like I discussed earlier with managed care. I think that, um, in part, some of that requires understanding technology, like I talked about, as well as being able to work collaboratively with different um, providers and different individuals within an organization as we move more of on a horizontal level. And that also requires the individual to be very engaged in, in learning, because there's going to be a lot of data and information being pointed at us, and we really need to kind of sort through that quickly and be able to utilize that for our patients going forward. Um, in the future, we're going to obviously begin to understand more and more about uh, the neuroscience and the neurobiology for our patients. Uh, cognitive neuroscience is one area that they talk about which is going to be really important, as well as um, a more personalized and more specific modalities for treatment. And that might be biomarkers, that might be genetic analysis, just different avenues. I think when we come in and see our patients, it's going to be a lot different as opposed to this really kind of general approach with medications or psychological interventions. Um, the, this organization also talks about kind of broader sense of competency. I think that's something that every physician needs to have. You know, we really need to look at different cultures and be able to engage with them. But on top of all that, there is an, a concept that uh, is impacting the field in general with regards to physician well-being. They say that um, in, their, in the literature, they were saying that about 50% of residents are actually burnt out. And we really need to focus internally within our field to say, you know, as providers, we need to build ways of uh, improving our wellness and care. And having resilience in the field is going to be key. And this also looks more towards uh, integrative care and, and digital resources that we're going to have, as well as um, moving towards less subjectivity and more objectivity in the information measurements that we have for our patients. It's because they say at the very end, which is really interesting, they say, knowledge doesn't always translate to skill. So. So I'll be going more so into future opportunities. 
Um, Carl Jung, in particular, had a really interesting quote. He said, your vision will become clear only when you can look into your own heart. Who looks, out, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakes? So there's going to be a lot of um, new technology that I talked about with regards to the neuroimaging we're using, DTIs, biomarkers, even now in genetic testings to analyze disorders. But um, as we kind of understand um, the human mind, in particular from a molecular and genetic level, how much of that is actually going to interpret into improved care and, and redu reduction in suicide rates, as well as some of the symptoms that we see? You know, and, and that's something that we really need to uh, think about because as we kind of move towards this area of rational objectivity, how much of that is actually effective? And I think having the vision and understanding that that's the end goal is going to be important. And um, there's various types of pharmacological interventions, such as ketamine, scopolamine, and different types of rapid uh, psychotropic medications that are being developed at this point. So um, as you know, some of us use TMS and different stimulators within the brain, and those can be highly effective for some patients. So finally, there's also this uh, com computational model in terms of understanding human failure, which I think was going to be crucial in our field. So as we map out kind of these intrinsic connections within the human mind, um, we're, we're going to be able to more determine the role of kind of neuronal connections in the brain and formulate more targeted methods of interventions, either through direct stimulation or through chemical interventions. And I think um, a lot of the computational um, parameters are going to help expedite the way these connections are formulated with pathology in particular. But this also gives us kind of a more of a basis in terms of how neurology functions within um, cognitive, cognitive processes, including things that we normally don't think about, such as memory and consciousness. Optogenetic is actually another interesting area of research that they're conducting, which utilizes light and targeted neuronal cells, now with mice in particular, but basically you can turn on or off um, specific cells within, within the brain. And they're able to kind of uh, understand and see how much uh, um, memory p plays a role in particular, which is really interesting because we haven't been able to kind of target that specifically. I think one of the studies that they talked about was um, utilizing this method and turning off rats that have been kind of um, traumatized through stimuli. And they essentially shut that down and they, they won't be... Um, be scared based on those uh, stimuli. So really able to kind of shut down kind of memories, which is, I think, pretty amazing. Um, one way that's a perspective that some people think in terms of human behavior is the way to kind of reduce cognitive bias. I think that um, many of us know that the way we think inherently is, is sometimes prone with error, and we tend to fill in the blanks a lot. There's a lot of opportunity where uh, either internal or external stimuli is deceptive in terms of the way we act. And, you know, there's, there's talk about how we are able to modulate ourselves with regards to kind of the stochastic effects. And that's just a fancy term of, of talking about randomness and, and kind of the unknown in the environment. So how much are we able to kind of adapt to that situation is going to be crucial for this perspective of cognitive thought. Um, they're saying that with regards to uh, the heuristic, heuristic behaviors, um, tend to develop as we grow with age. And these factors are going to be important because um, medication management might not be able to um, alter the baseline cognitive processing for some patients. And we really need to find alternative ways to kind of adapt to that. I think there's some famous psychologists, I don't know if you've heard, Traversky and Kahneman, who really looked into behaviors of the, of the human mind and, and how many of us are really fallible despite the fact that we do know um, uh, our own kind of intrinsic biases. So even understanding things doesn't inherently mean that we're going to change our behaviors. And I think we see that a lot with our patients. Um, so what do we do in terms of if, we, if, if a patient doesn't understand or does understand 
um, the way they think, you know, how do we effectively change their behaviors? And I think that uh, as we move towards, com you know, some of these computer models and some of the, the f interactions we have with our phones, they are essentially altering the way we act and respond. And um, a lot of the larger organizations such as Google, Facebook, and some of these technology companies don't explicitly say that, but we do see a change in behavior among certain patients, certain people. So, um, like I said, computational psychiatry is a, a, a kind of a budgeting field. We see that um, utilizing machine learning, artificial intelligence, and deep learning has become um, an area that they're beginning to develop, especially within the field of psychiatry. And uh, as we capture more data, we're able to kind of have more of a uh, targeted approach in terms of how we think uh, a person might be responding or behaving. And that can also be utilized in terms of diagnosis as well as uh, medication treatments that are more specific and targeted for patients. Uh, artificial intelligence in particular really utilizes um, means of looking at patterns of behavior. And I think they, they develop algorithms that are going to be more capable than we're able to do in terms of understanding the human mind. And what we come from utilizing artificial intelligence or even some of these uh, computer-based models is we need to kind of use the duality of understanding that they have an objective component in data that we can use and tool, but intrinsically we need to still be able to connect with the human being that we're interacting with. And Immanuel Kant, a philosopher, actually said it pretty interesting. He said, act so as to treat people always as a means to themselves, never as mere means. So he's t more talking about this concept of the freedom to think in an individual level in a rational and, and creative manner. So finally, um, I'm going to briefly touch upon various leadership characteristics. Um, and kind of skills going forward, which might be important. I uh, had another interesting quote that I saw. Um, they say, in medicine, you are essentially the medicine. And I think that holds true specifically within psychiatry because the interactions that we have with our patients really develops that connection that we have and that trust and response that patients have really is reflective in the way um, uh, the patient perceives the provider at times. And what I said earlier starts with the provider. That's the most key, important key. And um, we do have a large uh, mirroring effect for some of our patients in terms of some of these behavioral changes and really can be able to engage with their patients from an empathetic level. But um, that also requires knowledge of medication selections and, and being able to adapt to our patients as they need. So. This slide really talks more so about um, the role of a manager versus uh, a leader. And I think that's something that really um, needs to be defined a little bit more clearer. Um, they say in this, in this book that I saw regarding psychiatric, psychiatry leadership, they really attribute leadership more towards um, focusing on goals and um, competencies and different methods that are more inspirational in nature and not something more concrete and rigid. And I think that's something where we need to, especially working with different providers going forward, uh, really develop because that's something that's not something where you can learn out of a textbook at the end of the day. So some of the characteristics they consider are going to be important is um, this concept of openness. And I think that's something where we really need to uh, focus on when we um, look about both our patients and our daily interactions. And I think this inspirational part is, is, is significant because I think for us to be able to help define and change things, we really have to have a vision and get people motivated in order to be engaged. And this comes more so naturally in terms of uh, clinical competency, but also in terms of social competency is going to be a big factor as well. Peter Drucker, he's a famous uh, management consultant, said it kind of fairly eloquently. Management is doing the right thing, while leadership is doing, um, management is doing things right. 
leadership is doing the right things. So here's just some pitfalls. Uh, this is kind of a funny cartoon. Basically outlying kind of deficiencies within leadership. Basically indecisiveness, uh, narcissism, lack of maturity, um, and kind of focusing on self-needs. And these are kind of things that we understand and see on a day to day for certain, certain leaders, as well as uh, the lack of vision. I think that's a, that's a big factor to look at. Because if you don't have the overall vision, you really cannot inspire and motivate people to um, follow you going forward. So, um, Physician burnout, like I said, is a big factor within uh, our field, not just within psychiatry, across the field. And um, in part, um, a lot of, when I went to the APA, they, there's a lot of talk about physician burnout. And I think that is re more reflective of the necessity for change with regards to the system that we're in right now. Um, more so focused on the way we approach uh, burnout is utilizing wellness, uh, focusing on ways to build resilience, but also engaging on kind of this basic level of, of human autonomy. And I think that's going to be crucial. But in order to get there, we need the, the leadership and fortitude of people who really want to engage and want to change things. So that really speaks to this idea of uh, what Plato said, know thyself. And I think a lot of us uh, tend to kind of lose that aspect sometimes. Um, this shows briefly the variations of different cognitive biases people tend to have. And we tend to fall into this very automatic process that's fairly subjective sometimes. And a leader really kind of needs to be able to hold that back and be able to um, utilize their most rational approach towards uh, people in general. So. And all that really re is reflective on uh, different personalities. I think there's a lot of different approaches, different personality types towards management and towards leadership. And I think that part of the reason why I didn't go more so in detail is this, because there, there are definitely different styles and, and approaches. And I think for different situations, they can be highly effective given different personality types. And this is kind of more of a funny joke by far side, but just highlighting different personality types. Um, integrated care, like I said, is still going to be a, a, a big factor going forward in terms of how we're able to interact with uh, different um, different providers, including uh, primary care physicians, PAs, nurse practitioners, physicians, psychologists, nurses, pharmacists, and um, really collaborate together to focus on the vision of improving care for our patients. So I kind of threw out a lot of information for y'all, and um, I just wanted to go back into the original question and more focus on this concept of the future of psychiatry. So what does it mean in terms of what's going to make a good leader in the field? Uh, I think that there's um, a concept where we, we're going to be given a lot of data. We're going to be given a lot of means to understand our patients, even on a real-time basis. But in order to properly treat our patients, we really have to reach that human element and be really creative in the way we approach things. And I think this is going to be really important because as we have more information, we really don't want to lose sight of the ultimate vision, which is basically to be able to engage with our patients and improve their care. So I put embracing creativity, openness, and maintain curiosity for lifelong learning. I think this quote ends it best. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for, this, for the endless immensity of the sea. Thank you. Those are my references. And I think being kind and resource support is always a good way to go about it. Thank you. Do you have any questions I can help answer? Sure, Dr. Kahn. Well. Um, okay. Thank you very much. That was uh, very interesting. And, and I had a chance also to listen to Dr. Stahl speak. He <laughs> reflected exactly what you said. There's been major changes. Two I'm really interested in is um, it's a combination of uh, neuroimaging and immunology. Right. Right. 
Um, yeah, there's a lot of data that does show that uh, immunology is, is a big factor in mental illness. And they're actually talking about um, even the gut as a big area that we haven't explored. And I think uh, where you, I mean, it's kind of a, a dual nature in terms of what is exactly the origin of, is it inflammatory processes or is it mental illness that is driving some of these um, problems? And it's, I think, at least for, from our current understanding, we need to approach things kind of on both ends in order to kind of ultimately reduce, you know, the symptoms that our patients are having. So I don't think we're quite there yet in terms of really formulating um, a, a complete understanding of that. But I think you're right. I think immunology definitely plays a large role in that. So, and I know you work specifically in a lot of uh, immunological uh, treatment options. I think that's going to be kind of really important going forward. So I think I did look at some literature that did say that um, a lot of the uh, targets for immunological processes are, are going to be very effective for our patients. So, yeah. And Dr. Brown. So a question along the lines of the title of your presentation. Sure. You, you've been involved in the APA sure. career up to this point, and I'm interested in your views regarding the leadership of the APA and the directions that the APA leadership has taken us as the number of members continues to decline um, rather precipitously in, in the face of all of these challenges. Right. Um, so I, I want to preface by saying that I, I am no longer on the committee right now, so I, I don't want to reflectively say that you know I represent the AT, APA in, in any manner. However, I don't want to be a spokesperson for them, but I do know that they are concerned about that. That's something they're pretty, I'm starting to get the first slide here. They are very concerned about that in terms of how much are they, um, 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 engaging in, in, in the members. And I think part of it is, um, in order to kind of maintain their, uh, their current, uh, um, focus, they, they're trying to figure out what's more important for the membership. And I think, in large part, everybody has their own kind of worldview in terms of how things should be. And they're trying to figure out what's the, the most significant um, uh, problems for, each, for, for most of its members. But, you know, I think part of it is, is, it, is that we need more leadership. I think you're right. I think part of it is in order to kind of re-engage more psychiatrists into the APA or AACP in particular, you know, they really need to focus on how do we, how do we improve problems such as the way the system is structured, the way um, uh, um, patients are, I mean, providers are able to get access to um, either medications or social services. I think that's something that's going to be changing and I think that's something since every year they, ch they change leadership, they really need to look at it, and I, I agree. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, just, I just feel like there's a lot of varying levels of interest, but I know that they're, they are trying to engage as much as possible, because we do have um, people from various um, committees or various um, uh, representations within the AP that come to my committee in particular and they do talk about some of these problems where they're not being addressed and, and being recognized. And I think that's, that's something they're trying to work on, but it's, it's, it's a large entity. It's like medicine, you know, it's not, it doesn't change as quickly as it, I think it should. So, yeah, so, yeah. Um, what, something that I hear from my physician colleagues, I'm a non-physician, but okay. heard with the change in directions in healthcare, some of which you described here, mm -hmm. is the, with the changing models of um, the physician in, in any specialty, okay. certainly in psychiatry, of uh, no longer being the designated leader of an integrated team, where right. in the past, that okay. was what we were most familiar with. Right. And I'm wondering, in, in your experience, since you've, you're in your third year now, particularly for the, the uh, more junior residents and medical students, what do you think are the most important 
interpersonal factors and professional factors, I guess I'll call them, in being a member of a team, but developing and demonstrating leadership capabilities uh, through action right. um, to further your profession. I think that's a trigger. I think that's a good point because um, one of the things that they talk about with both organizations is this push for integrated care. And I don't think, uh, I think different people have different approaches in terms of how they interact in, in um, I guess, um, organizational settings. But I think that's something, especially early on in training and even medical school, where we really need to kind of help people um, develop the skills in order to be able to properly engage. And if that means you know, mitigating some of the, the negative attributes that we see in psychiatry, because it has to be a bit of a balance, right? You really have to um, do this push-pull because you're essentially not working on your own. You know, I talked about this whole uh, vertical integration versus horizontal integration. You're not operating within the same silo. And I think part of it is the change in that is going to be something where you know, we need to learn how to interact with people, and I think different people have different approaches, and I, I can't speak to that in terms of what the criteria are going to be for that, but I think um, I think it's, it could be something that we can we can teach early on, or the residency, and not me in particular, so I'm still in residency, so, yeah. Yeah, so. Any other questions? Thank you, appreciate it.